Michiganites. Hello, Chelsea Library. My name is Paul Birch. This is my good friend Fats Kaplan. Welcome to Catfish and Onions Song to Table series. All right. Fats, we have been friends for a long time, and on occasion you have told me uh, your background about how you got into folk music, and it's really fascinating, and I think it, it, it fits with this program, which is revisiting the recordings that Alan Lomax and his colleagues at the Library of Congress made in the Great Lakes area in the 1930s. Some of those songs for Alan were new and others he had heard before. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the songs that we've performed over the years have origins that cross countries and even continents. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of been part of your musical life. How did you get into folk music? How did you first get into wanting to be a musician? Well, um, I grew up in, um, in Manhattan, New York City. And uh, I grew up in a family of artists. Uh, art teachers, graphic artists, and um, I had a, uh, so growing up there in the 1960s, and of course New York City, uh, people are always saying, well, how did you get into playing fiddle and banjo music and living in New York City? Well, of course, the folk scene, and which was, was there. Now, I was far younger than most, because I started playing uh, banjo, a uh, five-string banjo, when I was around 12 or 13, and I had an uncle who was my mother's brother. Thomas Hunter, who was very influential to me, uh, a great character, and one of the things he did was he, he played Pete Seeger style banjo, and so I wanted to, to do that too, and I started playing some banjo and, and listening to um, uh, recordings, uh, records, um, and I discovered that the Lincoln Center Library, which was at that point you know, relatively new, I mean, not new, new, but relatively new, but the Lincoln Center Library, I could actually walk down to it from living on the Upper West Side, and I suddenly, to my astonishment, realized there are, there's just tons of LPs that you could take out, and they were, like, County was starting to reissue uh, old 78 recordings, and of course there was the New Lost City Ramblers, who I was extremely influenced by, and then kind of went back into the original 78s and stuff like that. But it was all there. And of course, before um, any kind of uh, computers or anything like that, or you know, let alone iPhones or anything, you know, it was this mysterious world that a young teenager I had to figure out. So I was just reading the liner notes and trying to figure this out and, and watching Pete Seeger uh, every week on Rainbow Quest, which was a show that uh, was on public television and he had different people on, including the New Lost City Ramblers. Uh, when I saw the New Lost City Ramblers, who were, of course, that was uh, Mike Seeger, uh, Pete Seeger's half-brother, and uh, John Cohen and Tracy Schwartz, and I was just floored by it. I just thought it was the greatest thing. and I immersed myself into that music um, not realizing there were really folk festivals or you know or anything like that I uh, immersed myself into that and uh, reading about um, uh, old uh, fiddlers and banjo players and uh, reading Mark Twain and I was you know of course I'm growing up in a family of bohemian artists on the Upper West Side and of course what does a teenager want to do he doesn't I want to live on a you know, live on a mountaintop in, in a log cabin, you know. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do, much to the horror of my, my family. So you go to the Lincoln Library and you discover Cluckle Hen. Yep. So what's the first version of Cluckle Hen that... that was it from the New Lost City Ramblers? It might have been. You know, I, I really can't remember. Probably, probably, and went back and you know found some other uh, 
early recordings uh, that um, early field recordings or something like that probably. So you talked about how that has um, a modal style of playing or tuning. What does that mean exactly? And why is that particular to, I've heard about that in jazz music for instance. Yeah. Um, Miles Davis is most famous for, for using that during the kind of blues sessions. What is what is that musically? What's happening? Well, it's m m modes are, you know, to, to get their, the early mo modes which go back, you know, incredibly long time they're they're based on like a C scale but then you start the scale on you know with D or you started on E and they have different <clears throat> they're just called different modes meaning they're they're not um, they're not a major or a minor scale in the Western sense you know I mean they're they're modal meaning like and a lot of them a lot of modal stuff has to do with like really not 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 hearing a major third in it which is a very sweet sound to the ear right it almost seems it's a very uh, uh lonesome sound it yes. seems to be in, almost in between fluctuating yeah. from one thing to another right and it's like like this tuning which is one of the early tunings that i i used when i first started playing banjo is is it's based off of the open g tuning but then you tune the third string up a half step so that there is no third and it would go Right. that sounds like a question mark to me yeah <laughs> and then if you so then, and also like so that's that's sort of a, that's and there are a lot of different you know modal tunings, banjo tunings, uh, stuff like that that I remember. I mean, banjo is something, five-string banjo, is something that I played. It was the first thing I ever played. And then soon after I was playing it, I got into playing fiddle and mandolin, and fiddle became my main thing, and as well as playing the short-scale tenor banjo, which is a different bag. But, uh, but you know, I'm still in the studio and at home and stuff like that, we'll break out the five-string banjo. So it's kind of because it's the first first thing I ever picked up and played. Well, when I listen to the recordings from that time and the recordings that are heard on the Great Lakes collection that Alan Lomax made, it seems like music from a number of Eastern European countries have that oh, feeling. Yeah. You hear it in Irish music. Yeah. It's the Scotch-Irish and, and Celtic music which came over and that's what became Appalachian Mountain music. You know, it could morphed change slightly and stuff but they keep that that um, that lonesome modal sound um, and also the modal modal and and variants of that pop up and you start popping up into you know Turkish music and Greek music right. and uh, uh, of course uh, klezmer music and, and everything else it's just a sort of a huge I it's Universal, it's this sort of like universal, lonesome, painful sound to our ears. You know? yeah. So, you're now a teenager, yep, and you've been playing uh, mandolin and banjo and, uh, and and fiddle, yep, and you start your life as a professional musician with these songs under your belt. What um, what was your first experience like getting on the road and actually not just sitting in your room and learning this music, but playing it? Well, I played, you know, when I was a teenager, around like you know, 15, 16, around that period, I was playing with a few other people, you know, that I've met some other teenagers who would, uh, were sort of into that music, um, to, you know, learning about it from just piecemeal. Um, and then I was at a folk festival in New Jersey when I was 17 years old, and I met uh, Roy Bookbinder, who's the uh, kind of East Coast fingerstyle guitar player, who had traveled uh, and learned from the Reverend Gary Davis. And um, uh, there was an after party, and I had a fiddle case which I had hand decorated with an American Eagle and my name painted on the side of it. And I thought I was pretty sharp. And uh, I'm sure you were. And Roy was. <laughs> playing in a living room for some people at the house, like, a, you know, at this house party, and he said, hey, Fats, why don't you, you want to play a tune? Because my name was on the case. That's fine. And it pays to advertise. So played, <laughs> it 
with him a couple tunes. I was 17. Actually, I first started playing with him a few shows, and then we did a record for Blue Goose Yazoo Records, which was run by Nick Pearls in uh, West Village. Did my first record when I was 18. We did a second one when I was 19, both for Blue Goose Yazoo label. And Nick Pearls was this eccentric record collector of old blues. He was part of that world, and I was introduced to that world of like, the artist R. Crumb, who was another fanatical record collector and a musician, and the, the whole world of these artists and people that were around. Now I'm so much younger than right. everybody else. Right. You How know. old were you now? You're 18? Like yeah, 19 18, years old. 18. So when you're in the studio and, and say, Roy, are you, you know, you're talking about a, an old record from yeah. this era that we're talking about, what's your process in, in, in taking a song like him and making it your own. Do you, in your head, do you do you try to get away from the original, or do you like to try to stick stick to the original and then just kind of well let that transition happen easily? Yeah, I don't try to. I've you know it's funny. I've never. There are people that, you know into old time music and tr traditional music, traditional jazz, whatever it is, that are very very like I'm going to play this exactly, to learn it exactly like the record and. You know, I did that to some extent, probably, but but I've always been a person, ever since I was really young, that I would learn something and then kind of change probably some things, probably because I couldn't remember it, probably because I don't, you know. Also, I, I felt that it was, that, well, that's the natural process. You If you hear a fiddle tune and then you play it a different, slightly different after, you know, maybe you forgot that that little part goes there or something like that. It's, but, a, it's a personal expression and also this yeah. music was was social music. This music was yeah. played uh, at celebrations, it was played after dinner, yeah. it was, there was always food, there was always some kind of yeah. uh, dance, whatever, right. you know, going on. Yeah, and I just feel that, that that's the way the music was, it was meant to change. You know, it really was meant to change, right. and, and I've never been. You know, people who wrote, who are, are you know sticklers for learning something exactly like the record. I mean, it's to me, it's interesting, and you could do it from a from a learning technique or something, but then you'd sort of want to change it. I, I you know to some extent, I would anyway. I always have. Well, the nature of recording then, especially for those who don't know, it was usually one or two microphones. The producers behind the glass really weren't familiar with the music. Often they would record, whether it be a Scotch Irish artist, African American artist, they were really vibing on it. Something had sold. They were after fool's gold, really. They didn't know what they were going to find, and they didn't even know what was going to sell half the time. Right. So, they were. They were. So just, the recording process was very rushed. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was not. There was. There wasn't a whole lot of thought to it. Throwing something and seeing if it sticks, and right. that's whatever they did, and it didn't matter whether it was a, a Yiddish. A comic, or right. uh, a guy from Mississippi, or a string right. band from Arkansas. It was like whatever. If you could play your song all the way through, right, seemingly without making a and mistake, and somebody buys it, and somebody buys it, you've got a career. Yeah, that's right. Would you play something on fiddle for us? Sure. Yeah. Um, Here, let me grab my fiddle. Let's grab the fiddle. Okay. got your fiddle yep uh, when did you, did you start playing fiddle around the same time as you start playing banjo no a little uh, about a year or two later um, actually when I saw the new Lost City Ramblers on Rainbow Quest okay. and it was fiddle banjo and guitar and um, I went that's it and I went, went to, to get a, now, a fiddle as someone who doesn't play fiddle but plays guitar and I've played banjo before. The nice thing about a guitar is that, uh, or a banjo, is that you can at least find two strings that are sort of sympathetic to whatever you're listening to. Right. If you have a sense of rhythm, you can, you can start without really knowing what you're doing. But I imagine that's hard with fiddle. Like how did you, how did you even get, how does one even get started in, in the world of learning folk music and blues music? I didn't, actually. I taught myself to play banjo and fiddle i mean i had pete seeger's little red book on how to play the five string banjo that was it i had that but fiddle i just taught myself from reading about it some and also just listening to 78s and and 
I would sit in my room and just like sit there just scratching away and uh, I remember some of the family saying at one point saying you can't you can't learn you can't teach yourself to play that that stuff you have to be born into it remember because I was from a artist family on that whole side and that only made me want to just sort of do it more you know and, <laughs> and so I just would lock myself in the room and listen to uh, old recordings and just try and try to figure out how what they're doing and how they're doing it, you know and I did and so I was self-taught you know um, well how about we play a song on guitar and fiddle um, we're fond of the Mississippi Sheiks who oh yeah we're one of the most popular groups in the in the South they were yes. African-American string band but in a way they were sort of like the Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys as far as being influential and loved and well-traveled and a, a song that I've always loved the way you play as uh, called Still Traveling On. You want to do a little bit of that? Yeah, here we go. Take it, take it, fat man. One, two, one, two. Appreciate you joining us today, Fats. It's um, my of course, pleasure. I love playing music with you, and I love talking to you about this. You know, one of a song that you taught me. I don't know how I missed it. And uh, in the folk canon is is uh, is Clock Old Hand, which mm -hmm. is known as um, My Old Hand is a Good Old Hand in the Great Lakes Collection. Right. Battle of Max Payne. Um, how did you first hear that song? Um, same. Probably the. It's hard to remember back when I, you know, could have been the New York City Ramblers or it could have been an original or, or old 78 um, or a field recording, probably, probably that. Um, and did you first play it on fiddle or did you first play it on mandolin? Oh, fiddle. Yeah, fiddle and fiddle banjo first, probably fiddle, fiddle and banjo. And then I recorded it on, um, why I recorded it, I can't quite remember, but I, I decided to record it on... Um, my second instrumental album, World of Wonder, and did it with uh, Kieran Kane playing octave mandolin, me playing regular mandolin, and Lucas, his Kieran's son, playing a tom drum. Yeah. Well, I loved your recording because when I heard your recording, uh, this has probably happened to you. I heard instruments that weren't there. They almost seemed to have a Middle Eastern yeah. influence. And when we recorded it together, we even made that more. Uh, prominent yes. through electric instruments and uh, all kinds of stuff. And like, this is a good example of like, and this is the way the Cluck Old Hand that we do it now has morphed more and more into this sort of, you know, influences of, I'm very influenced by Turkish music, uh, some Greek music, some Middle Eastern music, but it kind of morphed more and more into that as we did it more and more on stage. And that's a perfect example of the folk process. Well, let's play, um, let's play the last verse of, of Cucklehead and do the intro and then we'll play the last verse and take it out. That's okay, sure. Out.
thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Thanks, thank you to the Chelsea Library and to Catfish and Onion. Thank you for joining us for Song to Table, and we'll see you again soon.